Hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest episode of The Pitch. The Pitch is one of my favorite shows we do on Stock Charts TV because we get to bring together three really knowledgeable market strategists to bring some of their expertise, share some ideas with you. What are they looking at uh, given the uh, market conditions? These are uncertain times. It's an uncertain day and an uncertain week and an uncertain month and an uncertain year, it appears to be. We have the Fed Day today. So we're actually recording this just before the Fed meeting uh, here on Wednesday, January 26th. So please be kind as the markets evolve rapidly, probably right after we're wrapping the show. But I think it will give you a great window into how some really uh, you know, strong expert analysts are trying to make sense of these markets and what sort of bets uh, they're willing to make given the environment that we're, uh, that we're in. As always, you can go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch to see all of our previous episodes and certainly review some of these great ideas you're going to get from our three expert panelists, which I'm happy to bring on now. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We have Jay Woods, CMT. Jay's the Chief Market Strategist at Drive Wealth, coming to us uh, from New York. We have Mary Ellen McGonigal, President of MEM Investment Research and co-host of Stock Charts TV's Chartwise Women. We also have Joe Rabel, uh, founder of Rabel Stock Research. Guys, listen, thank you so much for joining. I know this is a challenging time. I appreciate you having the courage to come on right on Fed Day and, and, and navigating this, but we appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Great to, yeah, be, here. Great to be here. So, um, you know, as we go through this, just so uh, the viewers at home uh, understand, we're going to do things a little bit differently than some of the previous episodes. One of the things we wanted to do is try to make it a little more of a roundtable discussion. So what I'm going to do is start with our first panelists and uh, uh, Jay Woods. We're going to go one at a time through each of their uh, first ideas, then we'll go through their second ideas. And after about 25, 30 minutes, we'll have gotten uh, 15 ideas, five from each of them. Then what we're going to do is discuss them as a group and see what sort of broader conclusions we can draw about this current market environment. Jay, are you ready to go first? Let's go. We have your first chart. It's the insurance ETF IAK. Talk us through this one. Yeah, we're, we're going to start off very boring. There, there's nothing <laughs> sexy about this one. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned. We'll, we'll get a little more aggressive as we go forward. But, you know, we want to look at stocks in a rising rate environment that have been slow and steady and tend to do well. Um, you know, the, the sector, uh, the top five holdings, just so you know, are, are Chubb, Progressive, AIG, Met, Crew, and, and Travelers. And I have a feeling we're going to talk about one of those stocks later on today. But if you look under the hood, which I do, uh, when taking a top-down approach at these ETFs is you want to see strength in the top holdings. And uh, those six names that I just mentioned are all above 200-day moving averages within 3% of the high, if not making a new high. And th the drawdowns have been minimal. Uh, as you see on the chart, we've been channeling slow and steady upward, uh, making new highs, higher lows. These are the things we want to look at. And, uh, you know, the drawdowns, 7%. On this recent pullback, when the S and P finally cracked that 10% correction barrier, uh, so relative to the other financials, and when you're looking at the big banks, um, they have more headwinds. When you talk about uh, rising rates, well, okay, maybe mergers could slow down, IPOs could slow down. So, where in that sector will we see some steadiness and some continued strength? And, and to me, it's the IAK, and that's why I chose that as my first chart. Great, uh, great thoughts on there. We're going to come back to Q&A here uh, a little later when we can. Let's get to Mary Ellen McGonigal. And Mary Ellen, listen, thanks again for joining today. Your first chart, we're going to segue into it. We're talking energy. Talk us through this first chart, the XLE. Yeah, you bet. So what I did want to point out there is a look at how energy fared. Going back to the Fed's most recent or prior uh, Fed rate hike cycle. And we can see from that 04 into the 06 period that energy performed really quite well. And it has a lot to do with the fact that energy does fare well in a rising interest rate environment. We did have inflation back in that 04, 06 period as well. So if we look at energy currently, of course, this week, we do have the uh, strife, the Ukrainian-Russian uh, tension that is adding to the boost that it's getting, but longer term, 
energy from my work, I'm anticipating it to continue to fare well into this year. Your second chart here, continuing talking about uh, Brent crude, yeah, right? Yeah, so we're looking at Brent crude currently at that 88 level. When I Last year, energy was the top industry group, the top sector, and it did have a lot to do with this uh, hike in Brent crude pricing. I started covering energy as far as adding it to stocks on my suggested holdings list last fall. At that time, energy was trading at $40, $45. So we've seen a significant increase, but we still have a period where oil inventory levels are below uh, their five-year average. There is still anticipation we could see Brent crude get into that $100 pricing area. And that is another driver, of course, of these energy stocks that during the pandemic, they really pulled back uh, as far as their expenditures and their capital expenditures. So there are really a lot of tight uh, ships out there in the way of energy stocks. So we've set things up beautifully for your first official idea, PXD. Talk us through Pioneer. You bet. Yeah. So Pioneer is a company that is in oil as well as natural gas, two areas that are seeing quite a bit in the way of high demand. PXD is a name that I really like because they adapted a variable uh, dividend model. And at this point in time, they have very high cash flow. As energy continues to remain in that $80 level, there's anticipation it will remain high so that they can continue to provide a nice high dividend. At this point, 11% if you were to annualize their current uh, payout on that yield. And the company is very well run. They're, they're well set up. So we can see that it did pull back to that rising pink 21-day simple moving average, bounced off, and then has turned bullish with that break back above that 10-day. And your outside momentum indicators are quite positive as well. So this is one of the leading names. It is a pick uh, back there on that January 3rd, put it on my suggested buy list, and it's uh, holding in really quite well. Strong chart, even during a, during a, a choppy market environment. Joe Rabel, listen, thanks again for uh, for joining us on the show today. You're joining us from uh, Fairfax, Virginia, if I remember right. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. Your first chart. We're going defensive here, which is uh, I'm I'm glad you brought this up. I, I I think you were the maybe the only of the three bold enough to pick a pure defensive play. Talk us through AEP. Well, I was going to say I, I'll tell Jay I'll I'll raise him one here when it comes to playing. <laughs> Uh, safe. So, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is that I'm very bottom up. Uh, I go through thousands of charts and everything. But one of the things I do for my servers at the end of the year is I go through and look at all the stocks that are inside years. And so what I've done is I've got these horizontal lines on the chart. If you can see that the two wide ones going back are from um, 2020. That's the high and the low from 2020. And then the next two are for 2021. Mm -hmm. So all of 2021 was contained inside of 2020. So I look at all the stocks that are doing this and I like the ones that have a very like a compression look to them where there's not a lot of movement. There's not a lot of wild swings. The, the crazy thing about it was when I went through and did all of them, marked them all, there was a lot of utilities in there. And so mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure why that is. And one of the key things that I look at is um, it has to take out the high of last year. And, and it's set up to do that now that it made a little higher bottom. Like it's not going to do it from an overbought condition if it breaks out from here. I'm not sure I understand why it, this would break out and take off, but it could just be a defensive play and an environment could be very difficult in the general market. Yeah, I've often told people the, the reasons why usually look crystal clear in the rear view mirror. <laughs> so why don't we follow the charts first off? Jay, we're back to you. Your second idea now, we're going outside the U.S. I think you're the only one that brought a non-U.S. idea with us. Talk to us about Brazil. Yeah, I wanted to focus on countries that may be turning the corner or over a near-term basis changing. And uh, South American countries caught my eye. Peru looks good. Uh, you know, and uh, Brazil was the one I chose. Peru is EPU for those who want to take a look at that. That's above its 200 day moving average. It's a little healthier. But here, I think from a risk reward point of view, which I like to see, the, the setup is nice. So um, let, let's go under the hood again. The top holdings in uh, the Brazilian ETF or Vale, 
Petrobras, which is making a 52-week high symbol PBR, and Bradesco, BBD, which is also turning the corner. Those three stocks account for 38% of this average. So the leadership there, just like Mobile and Chevron are the leaders in the XLE, they look strong. And in Brazil, we're seeing strength in the leaders. So this has caught my eye. And now let's look at the charts. Let's look at price. Uh, something's changed. Uh, our summer peak, we have had that nice steady dead downtrend, nice channel down. Uh, and we paused. We paused at 26 and a half. We had a retest of that bottom, but on the retest, if you, you look at the RSI, the RSI made a higher low. So there was a bullish divergence that caught my eye. And then we had a strong breakout on a gap. Uh, right away, the trend has changed. Uh, secondly, we have a baseline to stop ourselves out if it is to fail and pull back to those recent lows. So what, what I'm looking at, um, the double bottom at 26 and a half is your ultimate stop. But from a, a trading point of view, you can get in at these levels and you can set stops at uh, 29, which is the first gap that build tested and rallied from. Uh, and if you want to hold on a little longer, 28 and a half, that, that first larger gap uh, with upside targets back to the, you know, the moving averages here. And that's 34 and a quarter at the 200 day. So to me, the risk reward setup is nice. And the potential for this to turn, if people are looking for other avenues, other emerging markets, Brazil could be the place to go. Really interesting idea. Those names you mentioned, the biggest weights, it's, uh, you know, materials, oil, and then, you know, some financials and they're all things that most likely, uh, you know, do well in a rising rate environment. It's a really interesting idea. Yeah. We're back to you, Mary Ellen, and we have yes. um, Matador Resources, MTDR. So staying in the energy sector, talk us through this you one. Bet. Yeah. So this one is a much smaller market cap. The company trades at about 13 times earnings, huge grower, 650% uh, annualized earnings projected for this year, 60% next year. So you're getting real growth there. I chose this one because if you were to look at IWM and the Russell 2000, super oversold in bear market territory. So really capturing that energy move, but moving down the scale in the way of market cap so you can capitalize on a potential bounce and move into some of these smaller names, which is anticipated as the year moves forward. It's a great example. Another another uh, solid uh, energy stock making new highs when so many stocks are obviously so far below their uh, previous highs. Uh, Joe Rabel, we're back to you. Uh, and we're actually remaining in the energy sector now for Mary Ellen. CQP is your next idea. Talk us through this one. Right. So um, this is, uh, it's kind of interesting. I mean, this is a master limited partnership. So a little bit different, but it, I think it's playing along with the energy uh, side of things. But what's what's important to me is um, if we look at the bottom chart of the chart, we've got this ADX line in blue, and it's been low for over about a year and a half. And uh, what I'm looking for when I see this is that it's telling me that there's energy building for a move. Um, and we've just been kind of working sideways with the low ADX environment, which means we have low trend strength and low volatility. And usually big moves start out of a period of low trend strength and low volatility. I also like the fact that the uh, MACD is cupping around at the zero line and starting to lift off. And now we're uh, taking out this 45 area uh, with a pretty nice wide range bar. I, I think the low of this bar is pretty important, especially in the environment we're in right now. Uh, but I do like the looks of this. It's hard not to like, I mean, at a time when so many stocks are pulling back, these energy energy still, I, I believe the only one of the 11 S&P sectors up for the year so far, the very young year that we're in the midst of. Jay, you now get your shot breaking down the uh, the energy sector, starting with Excellent. the XOP. Talk us through your your thoughts here. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm piggybacking on everybody, but at least I want something different, so I'm excited about that. I, I want to look at this on a time frame because, as you said, it's it's the only sector up in this this three week year that we're under. It feels a lot longer, and uh, I believe it was up 66 percent over the last 52 weeks. So people may take a pause and be like, "This thing is you know outperformed. Maybe it's going to take a break." And if we look at the XOP on the daily, uh, that's what it's doing right now. This 112, 113 area. Um, is definitely near-term resistance. Uh, but as we head into that resistance, once again, we're, we're trending higher. We're, we're riding the 200-day. We're making higher lows every time. And what I like to do now is take a step back. Let's look at where this thing has been. Let's go back to the highs of 2014. 
Now look at that trend line. We are right at an inflection point, an inflection point that uh, to me, uh, one, it gives you a nice risk reward setup. If it fails, you know, it could go back to, uh, you know, that near term uptrend and, and fail and then, then you get out. But if you wanted to be so bold, now this is not a perfect inverted head and shoulders, that COVID low kind of screws it up. But if you want to go to the low after that uh, in October, you have what looks like a slight inverted head and shoulders pattern, which if you were to do price targeting would be a 50 to 60 point gain to the upside above the neckline. And given that this stock could break out and could run, we could see a lot of momentum come into energy. There are global and geopolitical concerns that could cause uh, crude to you know, rally uh, well, well above current levels. Uh, you know, as a driver, I don't want this, but from a technical, technical standpoint, uh, this setup looks good and the momentum that could come into the XOP uh, could lead for a quick and fast move to the upside. So that's why I chose the uh, Spider Oil and Gas Exploration and uh, Production ETF. Yeah, and thanks for bringing the long-term chart. It actually puts this, this rally into proper context, thinking about the, uh, the, the path it's taken to get here. Mary Ellen, your next idea, CF Industries. Talk us through this one. Yeah, this is a major uh, player, if you will, in the uh, fertilizer space, also nitrogen energy. And it's kind of a play on Archer Daniel Midland. They just came out with a record quarter all about agribusiness and that play as we get into inflation. And CF is, if you look at it technically, I've underlined those three recent higher lows. This is known as an as ascending base where the stock pulls back hits a new high, pulls back again each time that pullback is at a higher level. And we are now poised to break out of a nice five, six week base there at 75. So technically we're getting a lot in the way of volume there. You can see that MACD is just poised to cross turn into positive territory, or it already is in positive territory, but that nice positive crossover indicating that that downside momentum has shifted to the upside. We have a nice positive RSI. This is another big grower uh, on deck for 340% year over year earnings growth for this year. Next year, 97% in the way of earnings growth. So a lot of good going for it here. Great chart and a nice recent pullback there. I, I see what you're saying. Um, Joe Rabel, we're back to you. Your third idea now into the consumer space, DLTR, Dollar Tree. Right. So um, in the last chart, we were looking at a low ADX sideways pattern. This one, what intrigues me, and by the way, all my charts are weeklies, um, is that we went sideways for a stretch and um, and then we got a, a very powerful breakout move. And again, I'm, so I'll reference the ADX because it does a really good job of measuring trend strength. And the blue line made a pretty strong move all the way up to 50 um, as this breakout peaked at 150. And now we've pulled back to kind of the scene of the crime, the breakout area uh, and the gap area. And we've pulled back to the 18 week moving average and this big support area underneath. So um, kind of uh, piggybacking on Jay's thought earlier is uh, I like the risk reward approach here because we're, we're sitting on a pretty key level. I mean, if this can't hold this 18 week and this prior support uh, breakout area, then it's going to end up being a failure and, you know, you take a small loss. But if, if it kicks in gear and this starts a trending move, the ADX is telling you this could be the start of something a little bit more meaningful. That's a great one. And, and again, these last couple ideas, Mary Ellen's as well, strong uptrends, then pulling back to some key support levels. Great, great, uh, great thoughts there. Uh, Jay, we're to your fourth idea. This is ARK Innovation Fund. I want to be clear. This is a bit of a swing trade, a little bit shorter term idea. What are you seeing here? Correct. Uh, you know, I am going there. Uh, this is the one stock that people ask me about more than anything in the world. But yes, we have to preface this. This is a swing trade. This is what we're seeing. And we're taping this before the Fed. So I'm going to really give you some levels that I'm seeing where you can enter, exit, and, and limit that risk to the downside. Um, you know, let's just focus on price action. You know, we don't have to go and, and talk about, uh, you know, who runs the fund, how they've done all 42 stocks in the index are down almost over 10% each. Uh, we won't go there. Uh, but what we want to do is look at that Monday capitulation 
that puking, if you will, and, and stress the volume. The volume was the highest in the fund's history, almost double any other day since going back to COVID. Uh, so this is what you want to see on bottoms. Now, we didn't get the follow through on Tuesday. We're taping this on Wednesday. We had an inside day. We had a pause. That's healthy, too. Doesn't mean it's changed or it's over. But what I want to look at now are what were the lines in the sand that were just drawn for us? Because now we have reference points. And to me, that's the most important thing. Uh, the stock was overdone. We knew that. 35% uh, below its 200-day moving average. 59% drawdown from its all-time highs. When you see stocks like this, and I do not recommend trying to catch falling knives, and that's what this is. When you enter, enter knowing your risks. And if we have a setup like I believe we do here, you can see a fast rally, a snapback, a dead cat bounce, if you will. Um, and from quick moves down come great moves up. And we can see 15 to 20% snap quickly. It could happen this afternoon after the Fed. So I apologize. But you want to use 73.54, which was Monday's capitulation close, as your entry point and as your stop point. If it closes above that 73.54 level today, I would want to buy at that point and then hold with the stop at that close. Um, if you want to get a little more risky, you can go to Monday's uh, low, not well, that, that would be a little too risky for me, but that 6850 level, uh, which was Monday's open, that would be another good place to stop because if this snaps back, it could do so quickly in a V shaped form. And as a technician, you don't like to call V shaped bottoms, you know, it's that's more luck than skill, in, in my opinion. Although Craig Johnson made an epic one during COVID, so hats off to him. But I, I think the potential with limited risk to the downside is finally there to dip your toe in the water in ARKK. Yeah, a great example of something that's come down so much and, and you hit on that, that falling knife concept. We'll probably grab that in the uh, Q&A session. I wanna, I wanna come back to that idea because there are a number of things that obviously come back uh, quite a bit from their previous highs. Mary Ellen, your next idea is in the financial sector, Berkshire Hathaway. What draws you to this one? Yeah, you bet. So all of this has to do with some of the top holdings on Warren, famous Warren Buffett's fund here. And a lot of them are hedge inflationary hedging types of names. We can talk about Kroger uh, retail uh, food, where they've been able to raise prices and manage to really improve their revenue and earnings. Also, a top holding here is Coca-Cola, another big one where they've been able to raise pricing in the face of inflation and are doing really quite well. Other big holdings include American Express. They just came out with earnings recently. The stock is on a tear, came in well above estimates. Uh, Bank of America in there, those that anticipate banks faring well. These are all top holdings as interest rates continue to rise. And then last up is Chevron, another big holding. And we've all been talking about energy today. So let's Let's take a look at the chart. We can see that it did hit a new high, uh, Berkshire did, and we are looking at a weekly chart. And I had been anticipating a pullback. I wrote about this in Stock Charts Chart Watchers that the stock was overbought, but it has pulled back quite nicely to that 10 week simple moving average mm -hmm. and is bouncing. You look at those outside momentum indicators, very constructive there. The stock is in a very nice uptrend after pulling back from that seven month base breakout. It's, it's probably a, a total misnomer to bucket Berkshire and financial. So I should, I should, True. I should qualify that you, you hit on the, the exposure you're getting uh, in a, uh, in a much better way than I alluded to as I was introducing and it. Actually, um, we can't forget Apple. Sorry. That's a major holding. Yeah. And yeah. also, also very, very, very true. Um, Joe, your next pick, your fourth pick is a uh, Amphistar, maybe a name that, that uh, many are not familiar with AMPH. Talk us to this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, frankly, because I just look at so many stocks and uh, it's sometimes something just kind of jumps off the screen. Like, what? why is this stock doing this? I don't understand. Um, and But, you know, I go back to my same theme. I try and be really consistent and look for a couple of different patterns. And, uh, and in this case, it happens to be, you know, in this healthcare area, but it's a more aggressive end of the spectrum. 
uh, with a, a smaller cap name, but nice sideways pattern, strong breakout confirmed by ADX and MACD. Um, and now I'd like to see, so my only issue with this right now is we're up against that prior high. I'd almost like to see uh, if I can borrow a little uh, Mary Ellen's commentary here, like a little handle form, uh, you know, a cup, you know, we've got sort of the cup, more of a breakout pattern, but I'd like to see it consolidate a little bit more and get a little closer to the moving average. So for me, it's a little too extended from the 18 week to break out and go. I'd almost like to see it pause for another week or two, but I, I really felt like it was a good stock to bring up because I want to keep this on my monitor, mainly because there's low ADX on the monthly. And this, this was a low ADX pattern on the weekly and the same thing on the daily. So we had ADX in three different time frames, all basically telling us we're getting, we have the potential to get going out of a, out of a pretty nice quality base uh, pattern. It's a great example. And I love the commentary just on, on, on how tactically, how to approach that. We're to our last pick, each of you, and then we'll discuss some of these in a little more detail. But Jay, your final pick is a solar ETF. And to be clear, this is a short idea. This is something that you're seeing uh, some further weakness in. Wh why? Yeah, well, uh, I, hats off to your colleague, Grayson, uh, who uh, had me on in October. And we wanted one scary idea. And, and I liked, uh, you know, the approach to find one thing that kind of has you looking, let's avoid, or, or if you want to play from the short side, I think there's good opportunity here. That's the TAN, the Invesco Solar ETF. Yes, it's been down seven weeks in a row, so maybe you get a snapback rally. Uh, if you do, um, I put a weekly chart here because I wanted to show the significance of this breakdown. Um, this, this stock, it just, it, it just looks awful, and there's some history here. So that 70 level was the major breakdown. So if you get a little rally into it, maybe a good spot to take a short position. And then if it rallies above 72, you, you, you limit your loss, you move on. But over the long term, and I, I wish we could expand back to 2009, because there is a seasonal and a political factor here in play. There is precedence with this ETF. Um, back in 2009, as Obama was elected into office, there was a big ESG push uh, and a big push into alternative energy uh, and TAN really took off. And then it broke down and it stayed down, it stayed sideways for years. When did we see the next big rally? When we went into the Joe Biden administration. So you, you had that same theme, clean energy. These are all great things, but from a stock perspective, they run up, they get a little ahead of their skis, and then the trade fizzles out. And we just saw that fizzle out with that breakdown. That's why I have it as a stock to avoid. And, um, you know, th this stock can go another, you know, 50% lower, I, I would think 30% down to the 45 level is in the cards uh, at, you know, at worst. Yeah, some of these, uh, some of these growthy things, you, you know, you can see the potential for much further downside from a technical perspective. That's a great example. Mary Ellen, your final pick is uh, back in the consumer space, Dick Sporting Goods, DKS. Yeah. Now this one is not quite ready for prime time. It is on my watch list. It was a big winner for my MEM Edge Report subscribers last year. We captured a great gain up 80% uh, throughout its uptrend. And it fell out of bed, uh, certainly in line with a lot of these retailers. We had weak retail numbers in December. Uh, the stimulus isn't behind as far as the government sending out checks. So there's a lot of concern in the face of inflation, of course, as well. But it is beginning to wake up, certainly among the very few in the retail space. It is breaking back above that red 50-day simple moving average. We're getting pretty good volume there too. The stock has consistently found support at that 200-day. And then the outside momentum indicators, MACD just poking into positive territory there. Likewise with the RSI, we did get that Kohl's KSS buyout earlier in the week that was a real boost for this group. But I'm going to want to see a few more upside days on volume and then more more importantly, that industry group gain traction. And then I think we'll be able to see DKS trade higher. Great chart. Uh, thank you so much, Mary Ellen. Joe, your final chart is Travelers, TRV. What's uh, what? Tell us about this one. So uh, this is like Pete and repeat for me. So I'm <laughs> the same sort of pattern here, sideways consolidation. Um, what's unique about this one, I'll say, and I'll focus on the MACD. So if you notice the price chart, the price chart made a double bottom uh, on, uh, yeah, from there to there. 
And if you compare the MACD during that period, it actually made a lower bottom. And so I refer to this as a, as a uh, reverse divergence. Uh, normally you're looking for the opposite, but in this case, when we have this reverse divergence where MACD makes a lower low while price is making essentially a double bottom, but I could call that a higher bottom while MACD is making a lower bottom, um, right near the zero line, that's usually a nice uh, signal for this to kind of turn and, and lift off. Um, and I do like the tight pattern. So we had a, a pretty decent breakout in a lot of financials and including a lot of the banks, but the banks came back really hard. The pullback in those were, I think, a little too violent and they might take a little bit more time. But when you go in through and look at a lot of insurance, it wasn't the same kind of reaction. They seem to hold their ground a little bit better. And I'm really focused a lot on relative strength right now because as the market's dropping, I'm looking for what is holding up. It's, I think that's really kind of uh, a, the best way to kind of make it through this right now. Now, the problem is that we don't know is the market got a lot more downside. And if that's the case, they could still go after these relative strength names that we haven't gotten to a point when, once we hit a bottom, then you want to go find all the stocks that didn't break down. Uh, mm. So there is a little risk here. And I would make sure if this re-enters the breakout, I'd try and play the risk reward game right now. So that's how I would look at it. It's a great, another great pick. And listen, each of you guys brought five fantastic ideas. Let's recap those very quickly for everyone watching, and then we'll uh, discuss them as a group. Jay Woods, you had five ideas that you brought to us. First off, we talked about the insurance ETF IAK. We went to South America with uh, exposure to Brazil, EWZ. Energy sector XOP, sort of broad uh, ENP uh, ETF. And then a swing trade, ARK Innovation Fund, ARKK. And a short idea, one scary idea, the solar ETF, ticker T-A-N. Mary Ellen McGonigal brought five ideas with you as well. You had uh, Dick Sporting Goods uh, in the consumer discretionary sector, two uh, picks within the energy sector, Pioneer Natural Resources, PXD, and Matador Resources, MTDR. We then went to the quote unquote financial sector, but I think we've established it's a lot of exposure you're getting through Berkshire Hathaway, BRK slash B. And then finally, one chemical name in the material sector, CF Industries. Joe Rabel, you're our third guest, and you brought five ideas with you as well. One consumer name, Dollar Tree, DL, DLTR, uh, an energy stock, uh, CQP, Chenier uh, Energy Partners. We had travelers within the financial sector, TRV, a uh, smaller uh, pharmaceutical name in healthcare, AMPH, Amphistar, and then uh, boldly picking a defensive, uh, a defensive play, AEP, may end up being the best performer if we really <laughs> rupture from here, AEP. Uh, in the uh, in the utility sector. So thank you guys each for bringing uh, five solid ideas with you. Let's get to our Q&A segment. And, you know, already, I, I hope everyone can see you guys, each of you are, are super knowledgeable about the markets, but also have just a great way of making what I think at times can be a very complex uh, approach to trying to understand these markets. You're making it seem very, very simple. Like it's it's very easy to do, uh, to find good ideas. And thank you for that. We're, we're recording this, as I mentioned in the introduction, on Fed Day. And just before we get uh, the minutes from the Fed meeting, we have Powell's press conference about an hour from now. Um, so overall, we're seeing the S&P rally after being you know, fairly disrupted uh, earlier in the week. We're seeing the S&P up about a one and a half percent, led by some of the growthy stuff, particular technology up uh, up three percent. You know, it strikes me as I'm looking at the picks that we all brought with us. Technology, one notable sector that we didn't uh, we didn't advocate any real exposure to, particularly the Fang stocks. None of you took a shot at a uh, Netflix down significantly, or any of those sorts of names, and Amazon, which you know is a uh, great company at a discount. What would you guys need to see from some of those Fang stocks to get you interested once again? Is it more of a an interest rate play and sort of that headwind, or is it just something technically that you're not seeing? Anyone want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I'd say it's a little bit of everything. If you were to yeah. pull up a Netflix, that stock is just down and out. They did come out with weak numbers. They guide it lower. They did just raise pricing, but that subscription model is just not in a growth mode. And you can see that gap down. It was down about 26% and it's just not recovering. So uh, you, I, others, maybe you can speak to that possibility of a potential uh, rally but at this point, I wouldn't. Yeah, it's, it's noticeable that after the gap lower, you really haven't seen much in terms of appreciation, right? A couple of days ago, you had, uh, you know, closing at the highs, but just no, no real demand materializing. Uh, Joe or Jay, when you think yeah. about the FANG stocks, you know, what I mean, would you want to see? I mean, if you want to talk about, 
Netflix, a uh, little one thing I'll say uh, just as an add on here is that way, way back, uh, late 90s, um, I did a study on stocks that gap down like this below the 200 day and went through them all. Basically, what I learned from it was typically you don't make your final bottom off of this type of sell off for another six months on average. Now, obviously, Things have changed a little bit with the uh, with the internet, so everybody has the same information at the same time. So they do. It probably happens a little bit quicker, and we see a little bit more of the V bottomish type of a pattern a little bit more often. But what I would tell you is that this is a this is like what I call I call like the injured athlete, where instead of being um, like a, a small injury where you can get back in the game the next week, this guy is going on the IR and he needs rehab. This is a, it, it has to go through an entire mending phase. And so that's kind of what I'd be looking for in this. Uh, it's, I think it's going to take several weeks, if not several months to really stabilize and prove itself again. It almost has to build a whole new set of uh, support. I'm going to take that metaphor of the injured athlete, Joe. That's actually really, that's a good one. I've not heard that one before. That's a great, uh, great one for Netflix. Jay, when you're thinking about the FANG stocks, not just Netflix, but even, you know, things that have had better you know, trends, things like Microsoft, uh, you know, again, off their highs, but overall, okay. Do you see things that concern you on a chart like this or what would draw you to this? Yeah, uh, let's let's talk about Microsoft because today, the uh, last two days, it closed below its 200-day moving average. Very similar, I mean, almost identical to the S&P 500. Uh, this and Apple, to me, are the two bellwethers that really move uh, move the index. Uh, I, I know there are 498 other stocks that, that can do that as well. But uh, to see it from a technical point of view today, if it can close above that 200 day moving average, even if it closes at the highs, I'd be very bullish on it, that we can say, okay, we dodged a bullet. The, the worst is over. This was the drawdown uh, historically. And now let's go back out to the S&P 500. We have 10, on average, a 13% correction uh, per year. We, we just went through a historical time where our biggest drawdown was 5.2% for 2021. And then week two, you're down 5.7%. So um, a lot of these pullbacks are healthy. And this could be a good entry point with you know, limited downside risk if you're, you're, you're using stops, you're trading accordingly. Because the long-term trend, while tested, which these things do over time, and that's healthy, um, it, it looks like it's about to hold up. So, uh, you know, I would watch the price action of Microsoft look more uh, towards the end of the week to see how we finish before putting new money to work there. But uh, mm. like that, and then Apple earnings on Thursday, uh, these are two of the key metrics, both in the Dow and the S&P 500 that we follow closely. It's it's amazing. We're 37 minutes in this. I haven't even mentioned earnings, right? Which is another another you know minor thing we have going. Can we have anything else happening right now in terms of potential for moving the markets? You know, Mary Ellen, as you were you know going through and, and talking about Berkshire Hathaway and, and and talk about names like Kroger and some of the more defensive parts. I mean, you're getting exposure to consumer staples, which has been you know really outperforming consumer discretionary fairly consistently. You know, but but a lot of your picks still are more on the offensive side. When you are in an environment like this, where we've seen a drawdown that we have, what compels you to still be looking for good long ideas? And is there something you would see from a chart of the S&P that would tell you, forget the long ideas, you just need to be defensive and wait things out? How do you make sense of that in this environment? Yeah, at this point in time, I and for the last four weeks, I've been advising uh, clients to keep their cash uh, at hand and to not participate. The markets are not quite ripe. They're not ready yet. I will need to see uh, from O'Neill's work, it's a follow through day and that has called pretty much every market bottom. And it is a case on the fourth up day uh, there are certain characteristics volume related, but I will need to see the markets turn positive. However, that one exception has been energy. I do uh, have four or five energy stocks that are still on that buy list. So uh, outside of that, however, particularly as it relates to growth, we do still have more work to do. Um, you know, Joe, I, you and Mary Ellen both in your comments sort of uh, unprovoked mentioned, you know, having sort of a tactical uh, idea, right, that, that something looked good, but you're waiting for a particular setup. I think it was with uh, with AMPH, if I remember right, uh, which was one of your names you were talking about. Let me bring that one up uh, because I thought it was a great I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about 
you know, how do you differentiate uh, when something goes on your watch list? How do you stay patient? Because I think a lot of newer investors, they get an idea and they just jump in and like, that's it. But you guys both mentioned, I think, a much more mature sort of seasoned approach, which is this is on my list. And then I'm going to start to look for these conditions. Can you talk about how you remain patient or how does how does something go onto your watch list and then into a portfolio, into a model portfolio? How does that work for you? Um, I accept the, the reality that I might miss it. And mm. uh, if, if a stock does something unusual and just blows it out from here, I, 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 can, I can accept that because I look at it like there's another bus coming in 20 minutes. You know, I mean, <laughs> if, if this were the only stock that I could trade, then I'd have a totally different approach. But I'm looking at thousands. And uh, yeah, so I like to look for... So the breakout pattern here at 22 and a half, I'm okay with buying that because that was not extended when it took place. But now I'm looking for entry number two and I would probably go down to it. So this is a weekly chart and we have the breakout on the weekly and I, that's my setup time frame. That's my trade time frame. It's a pattern that, that where I'm looking at a time frame. I'm saying this chart looks great, mm. but I'm going to typically go down to my daily chart to help me identify and really refine my entry, improve my timing, lower my risk uh, by going that route. But I like to show the trade time frame when I do these pitches, just to show the whole, this is kind of the reason why I'm interested in it is low ADX breakout, nice sideways consolidation pattern. But the reality is I'd love to see this form a little like on a daily chart, almost like a little ABC down towards the uh, support near 23. Uh, hmm. If we get that on light volume and uh, this just kind of comes back in an orderly way, I mean, <laughs> I just can't believe how strong the stock is relative to yeah. what's going on in the marketplace. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So um, something's going on and I don't look at the fundamentals at all. I mean, I don't have a problem with that, and but all my clients do. Like I work with a lot of, of, of big institutional guys and they're doing that side and I, they want me to have an unbiased opinion of the technicals. And that's kind of what I try and do. I, and I hope, I mean, we're talking about ideas. The whole point of this show is to pitch ideas and just get people thinking, but I hope everyone draws. There's some amazing nuggets of investment wisdom you guys are peppering in as you're talking about how you're approaching some of those things. Um, you know, going back to just the, the market as I'm, as I'm thinking about this, Jay, I'm noticing as, uh, as Joe is talking, you're, you're sitting still very impressively um, given the fact that we're in the midst of a crazy day. And imagine if you're on the floor in this moment, it's absolutely, you know, it, it's kind of like a nutty moment for everyone just trying to think about it. Can you talk about, I mean, now as you've transitioned to drive well, think about, you know, how do you make sense of a day like this? Is it is this the type of day where you just kind of try to put the earmuffs on and just, you know, and, and just sort of ride things out? Or how do you address the short term turmoil with trying to be a thoughtful long term investor? Well, it, it comes with age and experience that <laughs> you, you learn to sleep better at night. And when you see something like this, and I was just talking to our friend JC Peretz about this, I, I, it doesn't bother me like it used to because mm. I've been through a lot of things and we're going to see a lot more. You know, what, what comes, who knows? But, um, you know, from a floor perspective, th there is so much noise. And they, they, this is the day where they like to put the picture of me up on the phone looking panicked with Jay Powell in the background. So be, be, be on alert for that. Um, but there are a couple reactions to a Fed day, and now we're taping this before, and it's going to happen after, but uh, it's, it's turned into more of the press conference and people living and dying on every word. And you, you, you have to keep that out of your head and not worry from tick to tick to tick, but look at the longer term trend. That's why this Microsoft, the S&P 500, these are key inflection points. And, and there's been some disasters out there. You, you just look at the Russell drawdown. I think we were in a bear market. I don't think we are now, but we're close. Uh, the NASDAQ stocks, the, the amount of stocks below the 200 day moving average and that are 52 week lows. So there are crises out there, but um, you, you wanna take the big perspective, um, and look for the setups that match you, the setups that fit your risk reward tolerance, um, and and your 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 time frame. And as a floor trader, my time frame could have been ten seconds. Uh, so I am now trying to take that step back out. While I'll give you an arc idea uh, with risk reward setups, uh, I'm always focused on the longer term. My 401k, my kids 529. How you want to do those things. So on a day like today, it's exciting. Uh, it could be a pivot point as to what direction we go. Um, but uh, I try not to let the noise get in the way, as you said. 
Yeah. Mary Ellen, you know, you hit in one of your charts and I'll bring it up as I'm asking the question. Uh, you know, you mentioned sort of the the prospect of higher rates, which I think, you know, most investors either hopefully are acknowledging or or should be very soon, just thinking about that prospect of higher rates. And what I love about this chart that you brought, you started with uh, looking at the XLE was going back to a prior, uh, you know, rate hike cycle and and how that ETF has done. Can you talk a little bit about just the historical part or the history lesson of the markets? Why is that important to keep in mind now as we're going through and, and facing potentially multiple years of higher rates from here? Yeah, it absolutely. And as you know, technical analysis and really studying the markets, history does repeat itself. That is a very, very strong mantra and base for, I believe, all of our work. So, of course, I do want to go back and take a look at what worked during a very similar period. There was high inflation back in that 04 to 06 period, in addition to that rising rate environment. So, what did work and uh, energy is one of them. And also there were other names when you go back to 04, 05 that were top performers. Uh, there was Starbucks, um, Apple was a big performer, Autodesk, uh, and there was a big energy. BLO was the big energy winner, up triple 300%, I believe. Um, so that's another thing, piece of the puzzle as well, that it's not always just going to be these uh, inflation driven names, growth stocks will fare well in a rising interest rate period as well. It's great, uh, Mary Ellen. And, and what concerns me as you're as you're talking about, I think for a lot of new investors, their investment experience has been just this right edge of this chart. And they, you know, they weren't really investing at that period. And and I think one of the benefits of technical analysis is actually going back and seeing what happened during some of those periods. I appreciate you talking through that with me. Joe uh, Rabel, when you're thinking about this uh, environment, you know, the prospect of higher rates. You know, we may get some clarity today, but certainly it, there's been no secret that most likely we're pricing in three, maybe four rate hikes this year. How does something like that and the headwind and tailwind that means for value versus growth, how does that inform your stock picking now? Do you rely on the charts to just show how that's being implied? Or do you think of that as an input as you're, as you're looking at these, uh, these charts? Yeah, I keep it in the back of my mind, but I, I'm really just I'm looking for, you know, and trying to decipher the footprints of money. I'm, I'm really just going through and trying to see where the money is flowing. And um, I think, I mean, based on what the uh, Russell 1000 growth has done. It, so if you look at the growth versus the value, which I do, because I have clients that are both value and, and uh, growth guys. And so um, they're constantly asking me who's winning, who's losing and all that. And it's been a pretty volatile environment where we've gone up and down and up and down. But what hasn't changed since the bottom in 2020 is both remained in an uptrend. Now the growth has broken its trend. It's down below, it's 18 and 40. We, I use the 18 and 40 uh, and it's broken below, below both of those for the first time since the move up. Now value is still holding in and uh the uh, ratio has dropped significantly in favor of value. And I think here's the problem. So I think you can be a value investor, like own the value stocks and still lose money, like outperform dramatically and still lose money. That's my concern with what this, how this could play out because you have 23, 24, 25% of the stocks in these five stocks, uh, or not of the market in those five stocks. And uh, there's about almost 40% in tech. Mm -hmm. uh, and growth is just so dominant in, in the overall market. If those start to drop, I think it's going to pull everything down and uh, make it very difficult. But I still think you're better off playing some of these value side. And certainly the benefit of energy, not only is it kind of benefiting from being uh, what constitute as a, or a classified as a value play, it's also... Um, playing the infl inflation game and all these commodities moving up, I think that's really what why it's benefiting so much. Um, that's a great, great point, Joe, very, very much. Jay, you mentioned, I want to go back to a comment you made. I, I made a note to, to circle back to it. When you're talking about a couple of these ETFs with EWZ, um, with uh, the ARK Innovation Fund, uh, with uh, you know oil and gas, uh, you made the, the great points um, of the constituents or the members of those ETF, right? You're looking at the ETF, but you're talking about some of the biggest bets and the weightings. I think that's an important dimension. A lot of, I mean, as, as more and more individual investors have embraced ETFs, 
I don't think they think enough about what exposure they're actually getting. Can you talk about that component and how the construction of the ETF, the weightings inform what you're thinking about the chart itself or the, or the, the higher level takeaway? Yeah, it's, it's to me the most important part because you're looking at the generals, the leadership uh, from sector to sector. And we, we talk about the FANG names. Well, those FANG names are part of these index funds, whether it's the consumer discretionary being dominated by you know the Amazons and Tesla of the world, or you, you have um, energy, Exxon and, and Chevron, which I mentioned are forty four percent of the index. Mm -hmm. So you, for me, it's a top down approach, and my you know forte now is to talk more on a bigger scale and not mention individual stocks. But it's hard not to because you know what's driving it now. Arc is. Uh, you know, 42 different stocks. Uh, what are the highest weightings? It's not two, it's Tesla, which is the biggest weighting, but then it, it goes down gradually. It's pretty equal. The XOP is an equal weight index. So you want to see if it's all the stocks in that sector equally weighted, or, you know, are the communications going to be Facebook or Meta, as it's now called, and, and uh, Google, which is alpha. I'm, I'm losing my mind now. But, uh, you know, the communications are, are two primary stocks. And then you go out from there. So you hear all the time the S&P 500 is really only uh, five, six stocks, which they're dominant, but it's held up relatively well given the recent sell-off. Now, I, Apple and Microsoft, those are to me are the major generals. And if they are to take that leg down, then we're going to have some problems. But uh, so far, one general is coming back to the fight in Microsoft and Apple it's holding strong. So, uh, you know, I hate to say these two stocks are the most important stocks, but mm -hmm. when we're drawing battle lines, these are the ones you want to follow into battle. It's a great answer. Um, Mary Ellen, if I could go back to you, uh, you know, it, it strikes me as you were talking about some of your charts and, and maybe we'll take PXD as an example. You know, you strike me and, and Joe as well, you have a number of indicators on your charts at times. And, and Mary Ellen, when you're talking about PXD, you're hitting on the price, you're looking at the moving averages. You mentioned how it bounced off the 21 day, now back above the 10 day, positive MACD, positive RSI. You know, if this chart would start to roll over and energy's had a pretty good run, things start to roll over and, and, and certain of these indicators could start to turn more negative. How do you prioritize when you're thinking more of risk management? Let's say you bought this today. You know, are there certain indicators? Is the RSI or the moving average a go to that you would say, if this happens, no matter what, we get out, or is it more of the weight of the evidence and you look at all of them and try to evaluate it together? How would you think of it if a name like this starts to roll? That's actually a very good question. I mentioned last year that energy was the top performer, but it was not straight up and it was all about mm. interest rates impacting. So my go-to is going to be that MACD, that moving average. I talked about it in my report last Sunday where if I see that black line cross through the red, it's going to happen before that RSI turns negative. It also tends to occur when that RSI is in an overbought position. That's going to be my first signal that at the very least, that stock or the looking at the group as well, that it could at the very least consolidate and then potentially trade lower. And it is for me, as I'm sure for everyone, all about historical precedent. So when I look at that, uh, that MACD is going to be my uh, really go-to to tell me if energy is going to potentially stall or trade lower. And we got close to it uh, certainly this week. So going into the week, I was a little cautious but um, we're doing quite well. Hanging in there pretty well. Guys, an hour went by super quickly, but this was fun. I really appreciate each of you. You guys are, are, are super knowledgeable. I feel like I, I just, I scratched the surface of a lot of the expertise that you guys bring to the table, but uh, Joe Rabel, uh, Jay Woods, Mary Ellen McGonigal, thank you guys so, so much for, uh, for sharing some ideas with us, particularly on a very uncertain day. You bravely came on to share some ideas where the market is a moving target. Uh, but thank you guys each uh, for being a part of the show today. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Everyone, this has been a, a pleasure to host this episode of The uh, the Pitch. And I was, uh, was excited to be able to ask some of these guys some fantastic, uh, uh, get some fantastic answers to some questions on how to approach the market. I think the reality is in an uncertain market, we still are picking stocks and we're still thinking about how to weight our portfolios. I hope you got some good insights of how to play this uh, uncertain environment 
uh, using uh, using some of the uh, the best practices and technical analysis. As a reminder, all of our previous episodes, interviews, uh, and and uh, episodes of the pitch are all on our website. Go to stockcharts.com/slash/the-pitch. You'll be able to see the replay of this episode, but all of our previous. Uh, discussions. People like Jay Woods and Joe Rabel and Marilyn McGonigal have been on the pitch before. You can go back and see some of the ideas that they've shared. And I think that's some of the real value of following them and their work is seeing how their perspective changes and how, uh, changes and how they're navigating this market as things evolve. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good one. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.